Part 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You will hear the recording once only. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to four. OK, who's next, please? I think I am. How can I help you? I just came in on flight 372 from Singapore at 11.30 and my luggage hasn't arrived. I've been waiting at the baggage claim for about half an hour now and everything seems to have come off the plane. The conveyor belt has stopped and all the passengers have gone. So I came here to find out what has happened to my bag. Can I see your ticket, please? Here it is. So you came from Hong Kong today and changed planes in Singapore, right? Yes. The connection in Singapore was a tight one. The plane got in late and I had to rush to get to the next flight. That's the problem right there. There wasn't enough time to get your bags onto the connecting flight. Normally, Singapore Airport is very efficient. Now, I need you to fill in these forms. Your name? Jenny Lee. Address? I guess you want my address here. I'm staying with relatives. Just a minute, I'll have to look it up. It looks like 583. No, it's 533 East 67th Street in Riverside. Do you have the phone number there? Yes, I do. It's um, 9301-4269. So you came in on Qantas Flight 392. Do you know the number of the flight out of Hong Kong? Let me see. I think it was Cathay Pacific 900 or something. Oh, yes. It says here... CX912. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Right. Now, I need a description of the luggage. How many pieces did you check in? Just one. Can you describe it for me? Here is a picture to help you. OK. It's a big bag, like this one. Rectangular. Not hard shell, but soft covered. And it has a zipper around the front. Is it black? No, sort of a grey colour. Any identification? Just a tag with my name on it. Any other features? Well, it has wheels and a retractable handle on the end, so you can pull it, as well as the handle in the middle. OK, that's fine. Now, if your bag missed the connection, I'm sure it'll be put on the next flight. I'll email Singapore as soon as I finish here. The next flight comes in at 17.50. That's 10 to 6 this evening. You can pick it up then. 10 to 6? That's too long to wait. Can I get my uncle to pick up the bag on his way home from work? Sorry, you have to be here yourself to clear customs. Of course. I almost forgot. Will the bag come here, to this desk? Yes. You pick it up here, then take it over to the customs area. By the way, don't forget to bring your passport. You will also need to have the key plus your ticket with a baggage claim number on it. Oh, OK. Guess I'll have to come back tomorrow then. It's lucky I packed everything I need for now in my carry-on bag. Yes, that's always a good idea. Be prepared. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute 
to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk by a tour guide. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Welcome to San Fernando City Tours. I'm Mark, your tour guide. We have a lot to see in three hours, so make sure you're comfortable. We'll be traveling into the historical district first, and then into the town center. After that, it's out to the harbor, and we'll finish up at the lighthouse, just past the harbor. That will take us up to midday, and after that, you're free to do what you want. At the lighthouse, you'll have a chance to visit the tea room and take photographs of the magnificent coastline. Now, as we have only three hours, we won't be able to take you around the shopping district, but we think you'd prefer to look around the shops there in your own time anyway. San Fernando has some well-known tourist attractions, the lighthouse, for example, and the National Library. However, the little-known military museum is not to be missed. Be sure to visit before you leave. Now, there's a lot to do in San Fernando. Indeed, there really is something for everyone. For those who love the water, I can recommend a trip on the Seafarer, one of the most famous boats on the San Fernando River. It does an evening trip with a three-course meal included. It's great fun for everyone, but especially for young people in their teens or twenties. After nine, there's a disco on the boat, and it gets really lively. Then there's a climbing wall near the town center. It's incredibly popular, with a large wall for expert climbers and a smaller wall for novices. There's a junior wall and a creche, so it's a great day out for those of you with kids. And if you like walking, there's some great walking tours. The city sites tour is highly recommended, as is the walking tour by the coast. But that one's only for the fit, not really suitable for children or the elderly. For more mature people, or those less able to get around, I would suggest a tour around the vineyards. It can be done in the luxury of a coach, and it's a wonderful way to explore the region's wines. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Naturally, there is a charge for all these attractions, but you can get 15% off if you have an Explorer Pass. If you don't have a pass but would like one, the driver here has application forms. Just ask him for one and fill it out while on the tour. Then you hand it into the tour office. Normally, it costs $10. But this year, it's just $7. When you hand it in, you'll get your picture taken for the card on the spot, and then your card is ready to use. Remember to show it whenever you pay for anything. The discounts apply not just to tourist attractions, but some bars and restaurants. Basically, everywhere you see a red Explorer symbol. Ah, we're coming up to the historical district now. If you'd like to look at... 
That is the end of part 2 you now have half a minute to check your answers. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a group of students. Henry, Joe, Nancy, and Gordon. Discussing changes to their work experience placement arrangements. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Look, there's the notice that Professor Jones told us he'd be putting up confirming the details of our work experience placements. But I thought that was already arranged. No, he said he'd have to check with the companies that the days we preferred were okay for them. Let's see if any have changed. Therese is not here today, but her name's first. It says the Uni Bookshop, Friday mornings starting on the 23rd of March. So nothing's changed. I'll let her know. What about Manuel? He's not here either. Is he still going to the music store in the High Street? If it's mainly music, Yes, he's still down for that on Friday afternoons, starting on the 9th. Um, the day's different. It's changed from Tuesday mornings, but that's OK. I'll tell him. He'll really enjoy listening to music all day. Now, where's my name? Henry. Here it is. I'm going to the beauty shop, and I said I preferred Thursday afternoons. Oh, good, that seems okay. And my start date hasn't changed either. Joe, what day did you opt for? I'm going to Highway Hotels on Monday mornings. Yes, that's okay. And starting on Monday the 12th of March. Oh, has that been changed? Okay, I was scheduled to start the week before. I'll just make a note of that. What about me, Henry? Have I still got the Explore Travel Service on Wednesday mornings? Just a minute. Where's your name? Mm, let's see. Nancy. OK, here it is. Explore Travel on Wednesdays, yes, but afternoons and starting date is Wednesday the 14th of March. Has the date changed? No, not the date, just the time, which is fine. I'll get to sleep in. You lazy thing, Nancy. Chris's name is next on the list. Gorgeous Gowns Fashions. What a name. Yes, it sounds good, doesn't it? I'm hoping he'll bring me some free samples. So, has he still got Wednesday mornings? Yes, Wednesday mornings starting on the 14th of March. OK, I'll tell him when I see him tonight that his arrangements haven't changed. Gordon, what about you? I chose that software company that makes computer games. I can't remember its name, but I asked for Tuesday afternoons. Oh, oh yes. Here it is. Games to go on Wednesday mornings. There's a note here saying they have their weekly staff meetings on Tuesday afternoons. So that wouldn't be much use to you. That's why they've changed it to Wednesdays. 
starting on the 21st of March, so you can see their working setup. Okay, I'm glad they've changed it. I don't think I'd want to sit through a meeting every week. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions 27 to 30. Can someone remind me what time we have to get to our placement in the afternoons? It says here, mornings start at 9am and afternoon sessions at 1pm. Oh, that's a shame. I thought Professor Jones was going to change it to 9.30am and 1.30pm. Yes, he did say that he'd try to make it later, but obviously that wasn't possible. By the way, just in case, what happens if we're ill or something and can't make it? Do we phone the college or the place we're going to? I think we have to phone the company first and then the college. Didn't you get the information sheet about work experience at our last seminar? No, I missed it because I had to go to the dentist. What else did it say? Well, we have to do a total of 24 hours altogether, so if we miss one of the arranged sessions, we have to organise another time to make up the hours. And he gave us details of the presentation we have to give about our work experience. Oh really? What do we have to do? In week 10, we each have to give a presentation to the class about the company we've been with. It's 30% of our final mark for this subject. So it's going to be a lot of work. Yes, he's expecting us to do a lot of research while we're there so that we can outline the history of the company, its management structure, number of employees, other branches, etc. And he said we should use lots of visuals such as diagrams and flowcharts during the presentation. Yes, and we should also include what we did each week the different departments of the company or positions that we observed and try to relate what we saw to our studies so far. He gave examples like management style, accounting systems, information technology and so on. You were right. It sounds like lots of work. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a media studies tutor giving a lecture about news sources. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 35. Okay, now many of you will have heard about the predicted death of newspapers as people increasingly access the TV and the Internet for their news. Today, I want to look at the USA, which has very advanced news sources, to see if this is actually true. In the USA, the main news sources without doubt are TV, the Internet, and the press. That is traditional newspapers.
And although they are each surviving and growing, they are also changing. Obviously, TV news has been around for a while, and the early evening bulletins when people get in from work are very popular. I suppose we traditionally think of the morning newspaper arriving on our doorstep with the daily news. Interestingly, this is not borne out by the statistics, which show that readership in the U.S. is much higher when people have time to relax, when they're not working, especially on Sundays. The Internet is also a popular weekend activity, but shows no variation with weekday access. So people are using the different sources in different ways. Interestingly, local radio has been hit less by the grip of quite strong local newspapers than by the Internet, which is seen to offer a better regional service. But just because the Internet is seen as the new force in news media does not mean it is dominant. Television has, of course, been global for a while. But now technological changes which have fueled the rise of online news have also allowed newspapers to print and distribute editions across the world. In fact, Internet news, which is seen as the big competitor for traditional markets, does not offer that much variety. Often, the sources are the online versions of the newspapers, whereas television, in order to offer something different, has had to come up with a much more mixed bag of reporting, from hard news to light reports on celebrity events. Another issue is reliability. The Internet is virtually unregulated, so anything can be reported there, whether true or not. Journalists on newspapers have fought a long, hard battle to fight intervention and to retain the freedom of the press. Television, however, is seen as critical to political power and has become subject to harsh controls about what it can or cannot say. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 36 to 40. Now, one very critical factor in keeping newspapers alive and well in the USA has been their approach to advertising. Obviously, newspapers are heavily dependent on advertising revenue, and they have become more and more imaginative in what they offer, in order to make sure that advertisers use them and not other news sources. This has meant that, contrary to popular belief, Newspapers now have a significantly higher profit margin than the rest of American industry. So, how have they managed to raise advertising revenue in this way? Well, they have put a lot of effort into developing and maintaining a very strong association with the retail trade. And they've come up with a winner. A critical tool in their sales plan has been suggesting that the adverts they run can have vouchers. This has been enormously effective because they have found that not only do more people buy the paper to get the discounts, but also that this inevitably means much higher sales for the clients who advertised. As well as doing this, the newspapers have also introduced aggressive sales campaigns over the last few years. This has resulted in a significant and continuing rise in the number of advertisers prepared to pay the extra for full-page ads. So, what I would like to move on to...
That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You are going to hear a conversation about renting an apartment. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 1 to 6. How can I help you, sir? Hi, I'm interested in renting an apartment in your building. Can you show me around inside? Sure, my pleasure. Do you know what kind of apartment you're looking for? I'm thinking of something for my best friend and I. The apartment doesn't have to be too big, just something comfortable for the two of us. I'm looking for a kitchen, two bedrooms and a bathroom. Just something simple. OK, well, let me show you what we have to offer. We divide our apartments into three categories. There are standard apartments, upgraded standard apartments and luxury apartments. Please follow me. This apartment just went up for rent yesterday. The old tenants moved into a larger one. This apartment is what I call the standard apartment. It's small, but has everything you need. The kitchen comes with a refrigerator, an oven and a stove. There is one bathroom with a shower, but no bathtub. The rooms are a good size, and both have their own closets. The living room has enough space for a couch. We will provide a television for you. These apartments are very popular with students because they are affordable and practical. Right now, we are renting these out for only $1,000 a month. I think this is a little bit on the small side. There's no space for a dining table or even for an extra desk. We will both need room to study. If there are guests over, we hope to be able to have a dining table big enough for at least four people. Do you have anything slightly larger? Maybe just an apartment with a bigger living room? Well, let's take a look. Right now, we also have an opening for a luxury apartment. This apartment is larger. It has three bedrooms, and all three are larger than the last one. And there are two bathrooms, and all have bathtubs. The kitchen is also larger, and come with an additional dishwasher and freezer. The living space has plenty of space for a dining room. How much is the rent on these apartments? These are more expensive, usually in the $2,500 range. Don't forget that there is an, an additional bedroom, so you could find another roommate to lower the cost. Hmm, I think that's a little bit on the expensive side. We don't really have the time to find another roommate, so it's probably better to stick with the two-bedroom places. Is there anything between these two? Come with me. I can show you this apartment right now. But there are people living in it. There are no more of these kinds of apartments available at this moment. But if you decide that you like it, I can put you on the waiting list. And as soon as we have openings, you will be contacted.
Sure, let's take a look. This is the upgraded standard apartment. As you can see, it's larger than the other two bedroom apartment. There are two bedrooms and two bathrooms, one in each room. The living room comes with a television, but no furniture. The kitchen is around the same size as the other smaller apartment. The basic difference is the additional bathroom and larger living room. These rent for around $1,400. Now look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 7 to 10. Seems like a good deal. Do you know when an apartment like this will be available? That's hard to say. I know these people who live here right now should be graduating soon, so they might be moving out. Well, I guess I'll put my name on the waiting list. Hopefully there'll be an opening as soon as possible. That sounds like a good plan. I will notify you as soon as we have vacancies. You will have to leave us some information and a student identification number. Sure, no problem. My full name is Robert Jack Browning. Could I have your age, please? I'm 38. Your major? I'm studying biology. How about naming some of your hobbies? Hmm, fishing, golf, watching movies, and spending time with my family. Sounds like a good life. What is the price range of the apartment you are looking for? Somewhere between $1,000 to $1,500. Your student identification number, please. QS45890. Could you repeat that? QS45890. Lastly, could you leave us a phone number? OK. It's area code 236-580-2287. Thank you very much. I will give you a call as soon as possible. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi. Hello. How can we help you? Is this the Office of Institutional Real Estate? Yes, sir. My name's Alice Baum and I'm a University Housing Supervisor. Oh, good. I wonder if you could help me. I'll certainly try, sir. I'm hoping to rent an apartment from September when I begin here and I'd really like some advice on where to rent and how to rent a place. Advice on renting in Manhattan. We've got plenty of advice about that. The first thing to think about are the prices. New York is an expensive place to live, and Manhattan is the most expensive place in New York. Everyone wants to be here. In most areas of Manhattan, you'll have great difficulty finding a studio apartment for less than thirteen to fourteen hundred dollars per month. But there are areas just outside Manhattan, within a thirty to forty minute commute, where you can find a decent studio apartment to rent for $850 to $1,000 per month. That's a big difference. But then there are travel costs on top of that. Yes, there are. If you're prepared to make compromises in your choice of accommodation, perhaps you can find an apartment you like and can afford. Monthly rents also depend on two other factors, apartment size and then amenities. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Basically, bigger flats get higher rents. 
So if you can live without a lot of space, it's much cheaper. And if you're willing to take a flat which has street noise or doesn't have much natural light, then you may save some more money. I see. However, you could go the other way and get a bigger flat and share it with another student. You can cut costs by sharing a large bedroom. To find a roommate, check the listings for apartment shares in the housing registry. Share a flat? I hadn't given that idea much thought. Lots of our students do that. What about amenities? Can you explain that a bit more? You need to decide what facilities you really would like and what you can do without. For example, do you want a doorman? Would you like an elevator? These kinds of things put the prices up. I don't think I need a doorman. Is there anything else I should know? Yes. Remember, the housing market is very competitive, especially for affordable apartments. You need to be prepared to make decisions quickly and be flexible with your plans. Don't start your search earlier than four weeks before you want to move in, because tenants only need to give landlords 30 days' notice of their departure. Okay. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. And make apartment hunting your life for two or three weeks. That should be enough time to get familiar with the market and find what you're looking for. What's the best way of finding a place? There are really only two ways. You do it yourself or you get someone else to do it for you. That sounds interesting. How do I do that? There are property brokers who will find a place for you. They can guide you to the property of your choice and help you with the paperwork. Wow, that sounds great. But they do charge you a commission fee. In Manhattan, expect to pay between 12 and 15 percent of the year's rent. That means if your rent is $1,000 a month, the broker's fee works out to $1,800. Oh, maybe not a broker then. And what's the other option again? Do the legwork yourself. Look in the classified ads, call landlord companies, and do online searches. Check out our website first. You mentioned paperwork. Could you tell me something about that? Sure. To rent an apartment, you may be asked to complete an application by your prospective landlord. You may also be asked to pay between $50 and $200 for credit reports. Landlords want to see evidence of steady income and good credit. I see. Because you're a full-time student, most landlords will require a guarantor, someone to guarantee you will pay the rent on time. And when the landlord approves your apartment application, be prepared to pay the first month's rent and the deposit when you sign the lease. That's a lot to think about, and it sounds like a lot of hard work. Thank you very much for the advice. You're very welcome, and good luck. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear part of a radio program about do-it-yourself house painting. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly series on home improvements. Today's program is about do-it-yourself house painting. 
there's never been a better time for people who like to do their own interior house painting. Although people still lead very busy lives, thanks to the availability of various new DIY materials, you can now decorate your home in a more efficient and a more environmentally friendly way. In 2009 alone, approximately 53 million litres of the paint that was sold in the UK were left untouched. That's enough to fill 21 Olympic-sized swimming pools. It's easy to overestimate how much paint you'll need to decorate your room if you use guesswork. And if you know exactly how much paint is needed, you avoid unnecessary waste. There are automatic paint calculators available now. Most of the major paint manufacturers provide them. Look on their websites or just Google paint calculator and see what comes up. Then simply measure the circumference and height of the room in metres. Enter this into the calculator along with the type of surface you're painting and it will tell you how many litres of paint you'll need. But if you do end up with leftover paint, you can donate it to an organisation like Community Repaint. They will take the paint from you and redistribute it to local charities and voluntary organisations, so it goes to a good home. You can find more information about Community Repaint on Community Repaint all one word, dot org dot uk. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Another way of avoiding paint wastage is to check you're completely happy with your colour choice before starting to paint. For example, you can get a small sample of the colour you're thinking of using, then paint a board and move it around the room so you can see how it looks against your furnishings and in different lights. Also, it's always better to buy high quality paints because you get what you pay for. If you buy cheap paint, you might need to apply two or three coats to achieve the same coverage that you'd get from one coat of a good quality paint. You could also spend a week on a job that could have been done in a day or two. And consider the environment. Most paint manufacturers now sell water-based paints that don't contain harmful chemicals or give off harmful odours, so get one of these. You can also buy paint that's packaged in recyclable containers. There's a lot more choice than there used to be. You can only do a good job which will last if you prepare the surfaces thoroughly before painting. In fact, in many ways, if you want to do a professional-looking job, this is more important than the painting itself. If there are any cracks or patches of loose plaster, painting over them won't solve the problem. Take the plaster out and fill the holes, allowing enough time for the new plaster to dry. And you won't get a smooth finish if the walls are dusty or greasy. So washing with water isn't enough. Use a solution of decorator's soap and rinse well with warm water afterwards. When you're ready to paint, we suggest you use a medium pile roller for walls and ceilings. A lot of people tend to use short pile rollers, but these give a patchy finish, and that wastes paint and time. Similarly, Long pile rollers can create a thick textured effect, 
which looks messy. The same goes for brushes. The stronger the bristles, the easier they are to wash and reuse. And as you've chosen a water-based paint, clean your brushes with cold water, because it's more energy efficient that way. As you're decorating, keep transferring small amounts of paint into a tray and keep topping it up when you need to. This reduces the chance of it being contaminated by dust and pieces of dirt. And finally, water-based paint doesn't have a lingering smell, so that's not an issue anymore. But it's airflow rather than heat that helps the paint dry quicker. So, to help finish the job in the quickest time, leave your doors and windows open. The faster the paint is dry and the job finished, the quicker you can start enjoying your room. In tomorrow's program, I'll be giving some advice on... That is the end of Section 2. That is the end of Part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an extract from a university lecture on the topic of marketing. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Last week we looked at some general principles associated with marketing, and today I'd like to look at some of those points in a little more detail. So, what is marketing? Or put another way, what does the term marketing mean? Many people think of it simply as the process of selling and advertising. And this is hardly surprising when every day we are bombarded with television adverts, mail shots, and telephone sales. But selling and advertising are only two functions of marketing. In fact, marketing, more than any other business function, deals with customers. So perhaps the simplest definition is this one. Marketing is the delivery of customer value and satisfaction at a profit. In other words, finding customers, keeping those customers happy, and making money out of the process. The most basic concept underlying marketing is the concept of human needs. These include basic physical needs for things like food, as well as warmth and safety. And marketers don't invent these needs. They're a basic part of our human makeup. So, besides physical needs, there are also social needs. For instance, the need to belong and to be wanted. And in addition to social needs, we have the need for knowledge and self-expression, often referred to as individual needs. As societies evolve, members of that society start to see things not so much in terms of what they need, but in terms of what they want. And when people have enough money... These wants become demands. Now, it's important for the managers in a company to understand what their customers want 
if they're going to create effective marketing strategies. So there are various ways of doing this. One way at supermarkets, for instance, is to interview customers while they're doing their shopping. They can be asked about their buying preferences, and then the results of the survey can be analyzed. This provides reliable feedback on which to base future marketing strategies. It's also quite normal for top executives from department stores to spend a day or two each month visiting stores and mixing freely with the public, as if they were ordinary customers, to get an idea of customer behavior. Another way to get information from customers is to give them something. For instance, some fast food outlets give away vouchers in magazines or on the street that entitle customers to get part of their meal for nothing, as well as being a good way of attracting customers into the restaurants to spend their money. It also allows the managers to get a feel for where to advertise and which age groups to target. Another strategy employed at some well-known theme parks, such as Disneyland, is for top managers to spend at least one day in their career touring the park dressed as Mickey Mouse or some other cartoon character. This provides them with the perfect opportunity to survey the scene and watch the customers without being noticed. Okay, well, we mentioned customer satisfaction at the beginning of this lecture, and I'd like to return briefly to that as it relates to what we've just been talking about. If the performance of a product falls short of the customer's expectations, the buyer is going to be dissatisfied. In other words, if the product you buy isn't as good as you'd expected, then the chances are you'll be unhappy about it. If, on the other hand, performance matches expectations and the product you buy is as good as you expected, then generally speaking, the buyer is satisfied. But smart companies should aim one step higher. They should aim to delight customers by promising only what they can be sure of delivering, and then delivering much more than they promised. So then, if, as sometimes happens, performance is better than expected, the buyer is delighted and is twice as likely to come back to the store. Now, let's move on to look at the role of advertising. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.